is a recording of a talk of James Swartz on the Bhagavad Gita at Yoga Vidya Bad Meinberg near Hanover in Germany. Omamandam Paramasukadam Kevalam Yanamortim Dondwati Tam Ganganasadrisham Tatumasya Dilaksham Ekam Nityam Vimalamachalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Baba Titam Traguna Rahitam Sadgurum Tam Namami Narayanam Padma Bhavam Vashishtam Shaktim Chatat Putta Parasarancha Vyasam Sukham Godapadam Mahantam Govinda Yogendra Matashishishyam Sri Shankaracharya Matasya Padma Padam chastamalakanchasisham tam tautikam vartika karamanyan asmad gurum shantatam anatoshmihi vishwam narpanadrishyam aninagari tulyam nijantargatam pasyanatmani mayaya bhagurivod bhutam yata nidrayam yasakshat kurute prabhuda samaye Swatmana me vadvayam tasmai shri guru murtaye namahidam shri dakshina murtaye namahom sadashiva samarambam shankara chayamadyamam asmara chayapayantam vande guru param param ishwaro guratmeti Murti Beda Vibhagine Vyoma Vadvyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murtaye Namaham Sarva Vedanta Siddhanta Gocharam Tamagocharam Govindam Paramanandam Sadgurum Pranatos Miham Om Sri Krishna Govinda Narayana Paramatmane Okay, let's see, where are we here? Chapter 4, Chapter 5? What is it? Does anybody remember? Chapter 5. We're in Chapter 5. Arjuna wants to know. Oh, yeah. Good old Arjuna. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, 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 the poet's making a point here. Yeah. Vyasa, this was written by Veda Vyasa. Nobody really knows who he was. It's just really a, a title that's given to uh, great sa sages that wrote various texts, Purana texts and Prakarana texts. Prakarana texts are, are analyses, practical analyses by great sages or saints, great sages on the meaning of various uh, texts. So Veda Vyasa, he's making a kind of point here the way he's putting this because he could he could just uh, teach it he could just say it directly uh, he could just give the ideas directly but the the point is and I made this point two or three times so far is that uh, listening is very difficult it's very difficult not to allow your desires your likes and your dislikes to intrude on the listening process. It's a really, for this to work, you need to be very professional. You know, in business, if you, you know, in, in any kind of high-level professional uh, situation, people, there's a, people learn how to listen. You pretty much have to listen uh, when they have these meetings of the top guys in these businesses and corporations and legal firms and so forth and so on, because... Uh, they have very technical issues, very important practical issues, and they don't want people to uh, misunderstand what's being said. And everybody, of course, has their own opinions and their own likes and dislikes, but you need to keep insulate the, the, those from the teaching, from, the, from what's being said, or you'll just misunderstand it. And this is why, you know, this is why really uh, Vedanta needs to be taught. You can't read your way to moksha. You can get kind of close, but uh, 
you can develop bhakti, you can get a lot of the right ideas, uh, but you will misunderstand uh, the teaching. Uh, and so it, if it's taught to you properly, then there's no room for a misunderstanding, and then it's easy to apply the teaching. Because some people misunderstand things, and they'll write me and they'll say, but you said, this is a famous one, but you said in the seminar in such and such a thing four years ago, you said, and I've been doing this for the last four years and it hasn't worked. And then I say, well, I don't remember exactly what I said. And then I say, well, tell me what I said. And then, I, then I, I'll te I can tell by the way they repeated what I said that they didn't hear what I said. They had twisted it. They had misunderstood something. And I'd have to correct them. You know. So you can go. You know, you can, you can easily misunderstand these teachings. And since Arjuna is so emotional, and he's got such a desire to, to get out of that situation, it's such a painful situation for him, uh, he has a tendency to misunderstand. And so he asked this question of Krishna. He said, um, and Krishna is very clever. Krishna doesn't say yes or no often. Krishna answers, doesn't always answer the question directly. He answers it indirectly. Krishna, he says, Oh Krishna, you praise renunciation of action and karma yoga. Tell me what's better. A renunciation of action is getting rid of your, is doing less activities. It's renouncing activities. Karma yoga is renouncing the fruits of your action. So he wants to know what's, which is superior. Krishna replied, both renunciation of action and the performance of action as yoga lead to liberation. But the performance of action as yoga is better than renunciation of, of action. A renunciate is free from likes and dislikes and therefore is free from bondage. In other words, what karma yoga does is, is what? It frees you from likes and dislikes. Whereas just renouncing an action doesn't necessarily free you of any likes and dislikes. In fact, it's a dislike or a like that causes you to what? To renounce an action. You know, I don't like going to church on Sunday. So I don't go, I stop going to church on Sunday. You know, that's a dislike, huh? Now what have I done? I've renounced the action. Yes, very nice. I've renounced, renounced the action, but what have I done? I've reinforced my dislike. I like to go to church on Sunday. What have I done? I've reinforced my like. Why not just go to church huh, and take the results as they come? If that's, your, if that's what Ishwar is presenting to you. If, you. if a situation is presented to you, and we're talking now about situations that Ishwara presents every day. Every day Ishwara is, is asking you to respond in a certain way. Like, I, I got a duty to come here and teach class. <clears throat> I, can, I can say, oh, I don't want to teach class today. I don't think I won't teach my class today. Yeah. Now, even if I don't want to teach class, I'm going to come and teach class and, do, and, and leave the results up. If I don't want to teach class, maybe you guys won't like it. Or maybe you will. I don't know. How do I know? Right? I've just got a job to do. Ishwara wants me to do this job. So I do it, and whatever happens, it's fine with me. So my, by doing it, you say I don't want, I do want to teach class today, I enjoy this class, mm -hmm. actually, it's very nice, you guys are a great group and I'm enjoying myself, but say I, 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 I don't want to teach the class and I teach the class and enjoy it, then what have I done? I've neutralized one of my dislikes. Huh? I've overcome one of my dislikes by just doing it and saying, oh, it wasn't so bad after all. I had a bunch of geniuses. They all got enlightened. I didn't want to teach class, but everybody got enlightened. So, <laughs> huh? So maybe I should teach class all the time. That's good. I've, I've gotten rid of my dislike of that. So this is the idea. So letting go of action is one thing, but letting go of the results of the action is another. So that's what he's, that's the point he's making here. He said some argue that they're different, but they both lead to liberation. In fact, one of the, one of the um, requisites 
of of karma yoga is that you actually start to reduce your activities, your extroverted activities. Because in this in this journey, we're gradually we're gradually taking less and less of our satisfaction from from the outside world, from actions, and more and more and more of our satisfaction from within. Understand? We're learning to rely on ourselves for all the things we've formerly been relying on the world for. Because everything you everything you want from the world, you already have in yourself. The love you seek from other people, you already have in yourself. Your nature is love. So, if you're always dependent on a relationship for your love, huh, how are you going to ever get independent of the object? You're going to be always tied to a worldly relationship, to a situation, to a person for your love. When your nature is love, then you should be huh, converting that need to lean on on an object to leaning on yourself, to finding that source of, of love or joy or peace in yourself. So that's the progression. But you know, we're starting in the world and we have worldly relationships, but slowly we're going to, the Gita is saying, slowly you need to sublimate those worldly, uh, that worldly energy or that energy that's going into worldly things into self-inquiry. Through, first through meditation and then through, direct, through meditation on objects or forms and then uh, directly through understanding or subjecting your mind to the teachings of Vedanta, uh, reflecting and discriminating and assimilating the knowledge. So, so they're all good, they're both good, but the best is what is renouncing the results of your action. Renunciation of action without is difficult without karma yoga. So because if you renounce an action and you don't get the result you want, then you're what? You're going to be unhappy. But if you leave the result up to Ishwara, then it's fine if you don't get what you want. Because you're renouncing an action because you want some result, don't you? <laughs> you... Usually you want to get rid of some kind of suffering or pain or agitation or obligation or something like that. But you may not. You don't know. So, Because the thing is, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> that's, that's the whole point here, is how do you manage the fact that life is so uncertain? There are certain probabilities that you can, you can uh, consider. But there's no way you can predict what's going to happen. How, how the Dharma feel is going to respond or how you're going to feel. You don't know. And karma yoga involves what? Taking uh, that attitude of renunciation, in other words, toward what you think and feel also. Not just toward what happens outside, but toward your very thoughts and feelings. Because your thoughts and feelings are what? They're the result of previous actions. So you need to learn how to take the thoughts and feelings, good and bad that you have, in the karma yoga spirit and not make a big story about how you feel, whether you're really happy or you're really sad or whatever it is. You just need to take whatever result it is, the bad feelings and the good feelings, you take them as prasad. So that neutralizes your likes and your dislikes about your feelings. Because <laughs> huh? human beings get really complicated. Huh? They get really, really complicated. They have, they have worries. Fair enough. That's the nature of the human being because life's uncertain. You never know, so you're going to worry. That's, that's how you tell what a human being is. They're the ones that worry. There's no other creatures worry. But human beings worry. But then, what happens? Human beings worry about the fact that they're worrying. Huh? Here I'm worrying, and now I'm worrying that I'm worrying. <laughs> hmm. See, I've added another level of worry onto the original worry. I forgot, I haven't solved the original worry. I'm already worried about the fact that I must not be spiritual. I'm worrying. I must be doing something wrong. I'm worrying. Huh? Oh, now I'm worrying about my worrying. And the, huh? it can go on and on and on and on and on. So. 
I need to have this, this attitude. When a, when a worry comes up, just take it as prasad. Oh, well, there you go. Another stupid worry. Let it go. Give it to Bhagavan. Let him have it. It's all your worry, Lord. You take care of it. I can't be bothered. Turn it over. So that's called, so that's called renunciation. Turn it over to... Say, it's all yours, Lord. You don't, you don't have it. You're a man who has everything. You don't have worries. So I'll give you worries. That'll be a nice gift for you. <laughs> <laughs> Some argue that self-knowledge and karma yoga are different, but both lead to liberation. Therefore, the wise see karma and knowledge as one. In fact, karma yoga is just knowledge. When you understand... Uh, <coughs> the nature of action and the nature of your presence here in this Dharma field, it's, it's logical that you will feel this, you will take this karma yoga attitude when you really understand. You don't have to force yourself to take the karma yoga attitude. You just have to try to understand the logic that's behind it. And then you'll automatically assume that attitude. There's no, there's no other reasonable attitude if you're looking after yourself. You don't like to worry. Huh? You, don't, you don't enjoy this emotional stuff. You don't enjoy the anger that comes when you don't get what you want. You don't enjoy the anxiety you feel when you're waiting to get something that you do want. Huh? You don't enjoy that. That's not fun. Huh? So to take the karma yoga attitude, you solve that problem. You just offload the whole thing onto Bhagavan. Say, it's up to you. You're the one that's delivering the results so I'm not I if I'm delivering the results I can't I should worry but since you're delivering the results it doesn't doesn't do me any good to worry what am I getting out of this I'm just getting worry and worry's not helping the situation at all Wor worry doesn't change the results of the actions does it You've done the action, the result's going to come. Worrying about the result is not going to change the result one inch, one iota. If how I felt about my actions ch changed the actions, then the whole Dharma field would fall apart. Because I could what? I could manipulate karma. But karma is just an impersonal force. It's cause and effect. So my worries are not going to change the karma. Once you've done the action, the karma's in place. The worries, yeah, worry is totally and completely unnecessary. It doesn't work. It doesn't help. All it does is disturb my mind. So, unloaded at the beginning. And and get, and when a result comes, you know, don't allow that result to to puff you up, and make you feel when a result is good and make you think you're special. Oh, look at how clever I am. I got what I wanted. <laughs> huh? Or conversely, when a bad result comes, Oh my God, I'm such a failure. <laughs> I don't know why. I just can't do anything right. Everything I do doesn't work. I'm such a failure. Oh, Bhagawan's the failure. Say, Bhagawan, you failed. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> blame the Lord. Don't blame yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. I just say, Bhagawan, you jerk. I told you I wanted this, and look what you did. <laughs> Get with the program. You know? Well, you have to. Self esteem is the number one quality here. If you don't have that self-esteem, if you don't believe in yourself, and you don't help yourself, uh, you can't let what happens tell you who you are. Because what happens is not up to you. I mean, you, you, you participate. You're kind of a, a, like a sort of co-pilot. You put energy into the system, but that the system is going to do with it what it wants to. There's no one there's no direct connection between what you do and what you get. 
and your desire for that result. There's no direct connection. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you get something altogether different that you didn't expect at all. You have no idea what it is. And there's always such a gap, particularly for the big things, the important things that you want. There's always such a gap between when you want them and, and when you get them huh, that it's really useless to worry about things. Like my, I, my uh, uh, wife and I have been trying to get a, a, a fiancé visa from the U.S. government. We started two years ago. And just last December, that was t it took two years to really to get that actual visa stamped in her passport. And I spent I spent three, three or four thousand dollars, <throat> and I spent maybe two weeks or out of my life getting all the information together, and copies and forms and filing and this and that and so forth and so on. Two years. Now what am I going to do for that two years? Be anxious for two whole years? Huh? Get angry every time something, it's, you know, something doesn't happen. I want this at a certain time. I did this and it doesn't happen. Then I have to do something. What am I going to do? Make myself feel bad for two years? No. Then just what? I just do what I do and forget it. And wait. And, and already have figured out what your attitude will be when you get it. If you get it, you'll be happy. If you don't get it, plan B. Thank you, Lord, but I've got plan B. And then you just institute plan B. And that's it. So your mind stays clear between the, between the desire, the initiation of the action, and the result. Two years. Get a little piece of paper to prove that I wasn't a terrorist and she wasn't trying to sneak in and get the government's money and all this sort of stuff. Oh my God. We had to photograph, you know, uh, boarding passes from, from planes that we were on to prove that we're on the same plane at the same time and all this sort of stuff. Huh? And hotel bills and restaurants and all this sort of stuff. And pictures of us together taken in, in, you know, so forth and so on at different times. So they didn't want to, they didn't want to, me to sneak some little foreign person in who was going to like, you know, get the government's money or do some criminal act and all this sort of stuff. Like five pages. Are you going to come and, and, and just try to destroy the U.S. government? Are you a criminal? You know, anybody, everybody always checks no. But, then, but there's five pages of this, and you've got to go down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, all the emotion is, all, is just what? Just not getting what you want or getting what you want. And there's two ways to be unhappy. But to get what you, to not get what you want and to get what you want. Both ways are good. So, huh? take your choice. You're going to be unhappy anyway. Or, if you're a karma yoga, there's two ways to be happy. Don't get what you want and get what you want. It's up to you. <laughs> if your sense organs are restrained, your mind is purified by karma yoga, and you know that yourself is the self in all beings, you will not be affected by karma. It's like a soldier. If, if a person, if, if there's a, you know, very often you see these, they just had a case in uh, America. Uh, and they're still public, they just pu published, uh, just prosecuted one from Iraq, still going on. Just prosecuted the fellow. But there was some young guy, he was real angry, had a bad family life, didn't know what to do, was in trouble here and there had real aggressive and real angry, and he joined the military because secretly he wanted to kill people. He knew he was going to get in trouble if he killed people in you know, normal life. He just walked around killing people. So he thought, well, maybe the way to kill people, best way to kill people is to go in the military because that's what they do. And when you go in the military, 
uh, there are rules about killing people. They're, at, they're, they're very, very strict rules. Extremely strict. Even if you're being fired at, you not, can't always shoot fire back at the other person. You have to make sure of certain things before you can actually return fire. You know, if a person, if you're drafted by the, by the government and you follow the rules, then the karma, if you, and you kill somebody, the karma, where does it go? It doesn't go to you. The karma goes to the country, to your country. Ishwara sends it to the country, it doesn't send it to you. But what? If you don't follow the rules and you kill out of personal, uh, per, for pure personal reasons, then what? Then Ishwara sends the, the karma to you. Understand? So it's your attitude, it's how you think and feel it's going to determine the karma, the, where the karma goes. And if you what? If you surrender, if you do it for the sake of the Lord, then the karma goes to the Dharma field. It doesn't go to you, and your karma is what? His karma is removed. That's the principle here. And, and it's just a fact. So, obviously, it, you know, what, what's the, where did this whole thing start? Bondage to karma. I want to do karma without getting bondage to karma, without suffering karma. And this is the attitude that you take. You, uh, you offload it to uh, Bhagawan, uh, and you take the results as prasad. Your mind stays calm, and you're what? Your mind gets clear, and you get, you're happy. Because you don't, huh? Because what your, your intention is what? To understand the Lord, understand what the truth is. So you're fine. Organs, the organs automatically, he points this out, he's this the second time he said this. The organs automatically contact their objects. So you should not think, I am doing, huh? when you are what? Seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, walking, sleeping, breathing, talking, releasing, grasping, opening and closing the eyes. Okay. Uh, did, did everybody have a little breakfast this morning? Mm -hmm. Did you eat your breakfast this morning? Yes, I did. Well, we'll leave that one alone. But now, you ate your breakfast, but are you digesting your food now? <laughs> are you digesting your food? No way, huh? You're not digesting, huh? Food, your, your food is being digested, but you can't say you're digesting the food, are you? Because you're listening to me talk. <laughs> huh? I hope you're listening to me talk. <laughs> Maybe that's why people are kind of like they're, they're inside digesting their food. <laughs> oh, I didn't hear what you said, Ramji. Uh, I was digesting my food. <laughs> well, what's your excuse? Oh, I was circulating my blood. <laughs> and yours? I was breathing. <laughs> huh? You're not doing anything. You're not even thinking. You're just sitting here, huh? And thoughts are arising in your mind, right? Energy, words are coming out of this vehicle, they're striking on your mind, producing thoughts, huh? Are you doing this? Are you doing anything? Not doing anything at all. So that's what he says here. Everything's all hooked up. Everything's already happening. Bhagavan's, it's a whole setup here. Everything's on all the time. It's all being taken care of. Your feelings, there, whatever you're feeling, you're not thinking, oh, right now, let's see, what am I feeling? I think I, I don't like that feeling. I think I'll change the feeling. Are you, do, are you do that? You don't change your feelings. Your feelings change. You don't change your thoughts. Your thoughts change. Your body act, acts automatically. Everything is what? Going on. By what? By virtue of the gunas. Yeah. It's not, this is, you know, this is really not, it's, 
it's it's not rocket science, but it's hard because why? I'm so conditioned to what? Thinking that I'm a doer. To thinking that I'm the one that's doing all this. I'm walking, I'm talking, I'm breathing, I'm, I'm sleeping. Now just exactly what are you what are you doing when you're sleeping? Somebody calls you, what's that? You call you on the phone, what are you doing? I'm sleeping, don't bother me. When you're sleeping, what are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> so you can't say you're sleeping, can you? Or any one of these things. So then why are you claiming that, what, you're doing this? Are you the author of your actions? There's a guy, uh, a researcher, his name was Benjamin Libet, L-I-B-E-T, he was a Frenchman. And he did very, very detailed scientific, he's a psychologist type, of, so I forget what they call that branch of psychology, neuropsychology or something. And he, he showed scientifically that your mind is made up before you make up your mind. People still hate his research. <laughs> huh? There's still a big argument, a great big fight in the scientific, in the psychological scientific community about this. Because nobody wants to believe that they're being thought. Huh? You say, I'm thinking, but you're being thought. By what? By your conditioning, by Ishwara, by the causal body. The decisions and the thoughts are coming up and what? And yet you're claiming them. You're like a thief. You say, this is mine. Well, no, it's not yours. It's Ishwara's. This is what we call surrender. People call it surrender. Surrender isn't bowing down at the feet of somebody. Surrender is what? Letting go of the idea that you're, you're the one that's doing anything. Turning, huh? understanding that what? That Ishwara is doing everything. And that you're off the hook. You don't have to worry about it. You, that, you, that tension, that tension, stress. You know, stress. Stress is what? What is stress? It's just what? Worrying about the results. That's all it is. There's, you're creating a, 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 a separation there you're, you're taking responsibility. Your stress is what? Taking responsibility for what? For a situation that what? Or which you have no control. <laughs> There's a t that's that tension between wanting something and getting what you want. You see it in driving. You see people driving their cars. That's a really good opportunity to see the tension. In, in, in America, we have this road rage. Uh, and I think you have it elsewhere too. In South Africa, there's a lot of road rage. I, don't, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I like to drive just, I drive the speed limit and I just take it easy. I enjoy driving. I'm not in a hurry to get where I'm going. I like driving my car. I've got a big van and I sit up high and it's real comfortable and I just like to cruise along. When I get to South, now in America, most people, are pretty good because we've had automobiles for a hundred years and the whole thing's set up and people are not all as excited about the, have driving cars as they are in third world countries or other countries or you know and they're not so emotional about it although we do have the road rage not so bad anymore but I get to South Africa my god and I try to drive there like I drive in America whoo forget it mm -hmm. huh Everybody's angry. They swerve in, they this, they honk, they ride on your back. They don't want you to do that. And I think, well, what, where are they going? It's a beautiful country. So I'm driving along, looking at everything and happy, just driving the speed limit. And huh, it's making everybody mad. Huh? I'm thinking, where, why are they angry? Because they're, what? They're stressed about getting where they want to go. Their minds are not present in the car, driving the car at all. Their mind is way over at the future, and they're trying to like, huh, 
close the gap themselves. It'll get there when it gets there. Take it easy. You'll, your car will get there. It can only go. No, but the mind is so distressed that as soon as there's a little obstacle, huh? the desire is, is even the thought that somebody's in my way. You look way up ahead and you think, that guy's going too slow, and you start to get angry. Just the very thought will create the anger. This whole karma yoga is basically anger management. Huh? It's managing your, your anger. Because everything you're doing is what? Is, is motivated by desire. And so as soon as it looks like there's going to be some, the, the, the result's not going to come, then your desire gets blocked. Desire likes to flow. As soon as it gets blocked, what happens? It backs up and turns to anger. You start to get red in the face and angry and aggressive and so forth and so on. So, he said, so the solution is what? To, to analyze the situation, look carefully, and see if you're actually doing all this. And if you're not, then, then allow what's happening to happen in its own speed, in its own time. You're going to get everything you need anyway. If you do it or you don't do it, you're going to get everything you need. So, relax. Take it easy. That's the message here. That's what Krishna is telling you. Then he said, then he said, if you act after offering your actions to be, you will be not affected by the, the agitation just as a lotus leaf is untouched by water. Karma yogis let go of Attachment to the results and act with the body, mind, and intellect to purify the mind. The life, well, this is the way you know this. The life of karma yoga leads to inner freedom, while a life motivated by desire for worldly objects leads to bondage. Same old idea, nothing new. Okay. The self is not a doer. Again, same old idea. Anybody has any questions, please raise their hand. We'll just read it uh, carefully, that's all. When the indweller, indweller means the self, means the jiva, in the, the self in the form of the jiva. When the indweller is self-controlled and indifferent to the results of its actions, indifferent is the word, it lives happily in the body, neither acting nor causing others to act. Like Ishwar is doing it. The self doesn't create a sense of doership, nor is it directly or indirectly responsible for the results of your actions. Aha! So who is? Ishwara. See, Ishwara is the key to this whole enlightenment business. Understanding Ishwara, understanding Maya is the key to the whole thing. The idea and what is causing it? The idea that you're incomplete and inadequate causes doership and willful action. The self is indifferent to good and bad karma. Because self-knowledge is covered by ignorance, you take yourself to be a doer. Because you don't know you're whole and complete, and you think you're a doer. Just as the sun reveals objects previously hidden in darkness, Self-knowledge destroys self-ignorance and reveals the self to be limitless and complete. When the intellect is aware of the limitless nature of the self and is solely committed to self-realization, its impurities are eventually destroyed by self-knowledge and you will no longer be troubled by self-limiting thoughts. Those who see no difference between a humble Brahman endowed with knowledge and a cow, an elephant, a dog, or a dog eater are wise. <laughs> the, the, uh, the Yoga Shastra says, a yogi in samadhi, samadhi means seeing everything equally. So that's, that we call them samadarshis, that means they see everything equally. And the Yoga Shastra has a very clever a little verse, it says, uh, a yogi in samadhi sees no difference between a lump of gold and the excreta of a crow. In other words, crow shit. Huh? 
That doesn't mean the yogi in samadhi takes a pile of crochet to the bank and, and tries to deposit it. It means what? He sees the essence of everything as what? As consciousness. When the mind is rooted in the self, the cycle of births and deaths is neutralized. The wise abide in the self alone because it is free of defect and always the same. Those who are established in the self as the self by virtue of hard and fast self-knowledge do not rejoice when their desires are satisfied nor are they disturbed by undesirable karma. That, doesn't, that means what? They have desires. Remember, we're not, I said that earlier. We're not getting rid of your desires. All right? Wise people have desires. They're just what? They're not bothered if they don't get them and they're not excited if they do. They know that Ishwara is desiring through them. They're just instruments of Ishwara's will that the karma goes to Ishwara because the desire is produced by Ishwara and the results then therefore belong. And Ishwara is doing the action so the huh? so the results belong to Ishwara. So they just huh, they just let Ishwara have it all, and they sit calmly and clearly right, behind their minds, obso- observing and enjoying humorously enjoying their little jiva as it what moves around here in this relative plane in this samsaric plane. It's nice. It's funny. It's really funny. You you mean. You're funny, and the world's funny when you not, when you understand when you when you turn it all over to Ishwara. It's it's really a humorous uh, situation, always. This is why Krishna smiled, says as if smiling. He's looking at the situation from the self's point of view, and he understands this business with Arjuna getting himself all worked up is really pretty funny. He doesn't embarrass Arjuna by just laughing out loud. Because it really is funny. One time I was making love with this uh, woman and I started laughing in the middle of it. Because it was just so ridiculous. I just, I, I, it just was so ridiculous. That wasn't a smart thing to do. <laughs> huh? I just thought, how absurd. What a bizarre ritual. All those funny noises and that, you know. Rubbing and all that stuff, talking and and it just I just burst out laughing, and that that ruined the evening. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and you, and you look at you, look at it, look at all this stuff. I mean, look at it objectively. What is it? We're just putting so much. You know, these things are vasanas, our desires and fears, put so much meaning into things where there's no meaning. It's just, huh? We just, as Buddha said, there's no self nature in objects. I mean, they're, they're empty of, of meaning. And so we, we just, you have to force meaning into all these things. We have to say this is important and this is not important. But none of it's important or unimportant. It just is what it is. It's just stuff. It's just mindless activity and empty objects that look sexy and beautiful. And people don't, people, you know, have a real problem with the self. But for what reason? For one reason it says here, because it's always the same. They can't imagine what it's, how you could be happy if everything's the same all the time. Because Maya, what's, what's cool about Maya? Novelty. Huh? It's really, it's like being in a movie all the time, isn't it? It's, con- it's always new, it's always exciting, it's always different, it's going up and down. I, you know, people said to me, he said, why, why would I want to be enlightened? No, they really said, I like, I enjoy in this life, even though they're suffering. I enjoy in this life. Huh? They think it's going to be boring there, but it's not boring, because you're full. It's just funny, because to see this, this, this movie projected by by ignorance, you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonder that it's even there to see it projected on that screen and see it that the screen is unaffected, that you're unaffected by that movie. 
It's just funny. I call that the fourth guna, the humor guna. <laughs> the self is the humor guna. It's not a guna, obviously, but... So these people, like, they're, they're completely detached. It's called vairagis. They're vairagis. They're completely detached, and they got a great sense of humor and a sense of irony. Because there's always, there's, always there's always a contradiction right, between satya and mitya. It's, huh? How can the thing and its opposite be sitting side by side and, and they not have any connection to each other? How can that be? That's really weird. In fact, a lot of, most humor is what? Just putting two really strange things that don't belong together together, isn't it? You see, huh? You see so many of these movies where you get this great big fat black person and a skinny little white person. You know, and one's gay and the other's straight. They get all these differences together and pack them into these two characters and then they cause them to interact and it's just funny simply because they're so different and there's such a such a difference between maya and the self that it's funny that's all he says now he's getting ready to talk about the next the next chapter chapter six okay where let's see oh, we didn't finish this oh 21 when the mind no longer tries to connect the sense organs with their respective objects, it becomes complete, permanently fulfilled. You're saying they're already connected, so why are you trying to connect your mind to certain objects? The, the objects that you need to connect to, Ishwar will connect you to. So stop worrying about connecting your organs to various objects. Don't worry about it. It's fine. He says... So this is a sign of, this is how you do, this is an enlightened person. They don't try to connect their sense organs to objects. What do they do? They just allow Ishwara, they know that Ishwara is always connecting you, always putting you in the right situation, creating a connection between you and, and the world all the time. So they just turn it over, let it be, whatever it is. If, you're try if you don't like what you're hearing and smelling and tasting and feeling and touching, what does it mean? You're not surrendered to Ishwara. You say, well, okay, that, I, I'm taking over, I'm taking charge here. Well, as soon as you take charge, then what? You get the karma from that. So why not just let Ishwara do it? That's the idea. Pleasure, and it says... And why are you doing this? Why are you connecting to objects? For pleasure. You want to feel good, right? But, but what's the downside of feeling good? Feeling bad. <laughs> huh? What? Pleasure arising from the context of organs and their objects is a source of pain. Because it begins and ends. So, okay, I want, I want to feel good, but I know that I'm going to feel bad after I feel good. Why are you going to feel bad? Because you're not feeling good anymore. And you wanted to feel good. So, uh, so are, you, are you beating the system by hooking up huh, your, your senses to objects? To get some pleasure? No, you're not. And when your mind gets really quiet, even just pleasure itself is, is uncomfortable. You know why? Because your mind has to stay with the object. But your mind... huh? And you have to bring your mind out of the self to what? To stick with the object. My, my, my wife, I, at one point, I used to love music. I had a big hard drive with like 100 gigabytes of really nice music. And as my mind got more and more and more quiet, I started listening less and less and less. And, and I thought, this is kind of strange because I really love music. And, 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 a, and after a while, 
Huh? I did. I just saw myself one day deleting all of my music. And you know why I did that? Because I was getting so much more bliss out of the quiet mind that wasn't modified, the mind that was just sitting on the self, just sipping that nectar of bliss from the self, that to, to modify to the music, to keep paying attention to the music, was a big effort. It was so much effort to get pleasure that way when I had such a such a, a beautiful, full sense of satisfaction uh, by just keeping my mind like close to myself, on myself all the time, that I quit interest in music or anything else. Your mind has to like go away from the self to what? To stay with the object. Activities are activities or objects, whatever. Activities and objects. And it's actually painful to do it. So what? You can see why these people, like Ramana and so forth, just went to the cave. Went to a mountain and sat in the cave. Huh? Because their mind, his, he said when he got, his mind just became fascinated by this, by the self. You do, you just become fascinated. And the mind doesn't even want pleasure anymore. And you immediately see the pleasure, the pain that's involved with the pleasure. Food, sex, all that stuff. You, you, um, you immediately see the downside, and so you're just not interested. You just become completely indifferent to all that. And it's not that you're dead or bored. It's just that you're so full and so satisfied and so happy in yourself that yet, uh, chasing some object is just... Uh, not worth the trouble. People say, oh, you're not any fun anymore. Yeah, I get this often. You're, you used to be so much fun. You're not fun anymore. You don't like to go out to, to dinner. No, I don't like to go out to dinner. I love to go out to dinner, but hey, nowadays you can't go to any place that's quiet. Every place you go to, to go to dinner, everybody's shouting and drinking and talking at the top of their lungs. And the noise, it's like incredible. You can't hear yourself think. It's so unpleasant and uncomfortable. Oh no, these people love it. Have another beer and they're talking loud or yelling at each other. The people at the next table, are, they're all drinking and eating and yelling at each other. Oh, it's worse than, I don't know what it's, I, I'd like, rather be tortured in an Iraqi prison than... <laughs> They go out to dinner with a, a bunch of, you know, upper middle class people right, who are trying to be happy or are trying to stimulate themselves or trying to get excited over something or, you know, because their minds are so disturbed. So that's the, the idea here. So pleasure arising from the contact of organs and their objects is a source of pain because it begins and ends. The wise don't celebrate it. The karma yoga attitude brings happiness because it prefer, purifies desire and anger. If you are awake to the self, revel in the self, and are satisfied with the self alone, you are free. When your impurities are removed, your doubts resolved, and you're happily engaged in serving all beings, you will easily attain liberation. A mind free of desire and anger is liberated here and hereafter. If the senses are shut down, now he's getting ready to talk about the next. This is leading into the next topic. If the senses are shut down and inhalation and exhalation are balanced, liberation happens for the meditative person who is not a slave to the body-mind-sense complex and for whom freedom is the only goal. Know me, meaning Ishwara, as the sustainer of rituals and disciplines the Lord of all the world, friend of all beings, and be free. <coughs> so that that ends the first. Well, no, I'm sorry. We have one more. We have one more topic in the section on karma and the jiva. And here we're entering into uh, a slightly different phase: meditation. Meditation is not for purifying the mind. Meditation is for focusing the mind on the self. For fixing the mind. It's creating an, an inner environment 
where it's easy and, and uh, it's easy to discriminate. Now, there will be purification as a result of this because you won't be doing other stupid things. <laughs> if you're meditating, you're not hitting the bars, right? You're not chasing objects and so forth and so on. The object that you're chasing here is what? Is a quiet mind. So that the, the result of your action is what? I'm meditating for a quiet mind. And I want, to, I want my mind focused and clear so that, it, uh, assuming what? Assuming that, that I want have some self-knowledge, I know what, why I'm meditating. Why am I meditating? For moksha. And what? I have karma yoga in place. See, he, why, did, why didn't he start meditation at the beginning? It's really funny how a lot of people in the spiritual world start with meditation. Huh? Isn't it? In fact, most people I meet, they began with TM or, or Zen or some other form of meditation. But here, there's like six chap five chapters, no discussion of meditation, and then in the sixth chapter, he starts talking about meditation. That's not an accident. <laughs> Why? Why is meditation the sixth chapter? Because if, if you don't have karma... Okay, I'm agitated. I, my vastness are bothering me. I'm agitated. I want a calm mind. And somebody says, you should meditate. I say, okay, I'll meditate. How do I meditate? You meditate. Okay, sit down, close your eyes, let it out, watch your breath, go in and out, chant your mantra, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, whatever it is. You got your little meditation, and then what? All that stress goes away. Oh my God, it feels great. Jesus, really good. You just sit there. All alone, just with yourself. It's so nice, no more stress, whatever, and so forth and so on. Then what happens? Oh my God, I've got to do X, Y, Z, huh? Can't meditate all Because you're meditating to get rid of stress. So then what do you do? You go right back to your life in the same way you went before, huh? In the, you go back to the life that produced stress and you, uh, you uh, act, get all those vasanas activated again. No karma yoga attitude. You get yourself all stressed out and you say, Oh my God, I'm stressed out. I've got to meditate. Where do, you, huh? Where do you get spiritually? You get nowhere. It's like treading water, you know, treading water in, your, in the in a, in the ocean, and you, you know you can't swim all the way. You can't swim to the shore. It's too far. You don't want to sink, so you just keep moving just to keep from sinking. You're not going anywhere at all, because as soon as you go back to the world, you agitate yourself. As soon as you meditate, you get rid of your agitation. But you go back, you agitate yourself again. So it's just, uh, I don't know how, I've got a very good friend. Uh, he was uh, 30 years <coughs> meditating. He's a slow learner. After 30 years, he figured out, uh-oh, i got to quit this. He was very, huh? And then he got to Vedanta. Within about two years, he realized himself. 30 years. No karma yoga. The vasanas were just what? Not removed. They weren't purified. So that's why we have it. That's why it's set up like this. Yeah. If you, you know, if you got your karma yoga practice, then that's going to really help your meditation. Because you're going to have less and less of vasana load to deal with when you sit down to meditate. In a minute or two, even by thinking the thought, I need to meditate, you'll go into meditation if your vasana load is reduced, if your mind is predominantly sattvic. And you should choose, huh? Uh, we'll, we'll discuss it here. He's going to discuss meditation. Because it's, it's a great tool. And it is an action. <coughs> you, you, and you don't, in Vedanta, we don't, we, we don't meditate for the experience of the self. This is a problem. Most people. Most people think, 
the meditation is going to get them enlightened, right? So they think they're going by sitting down. This action is going to produce the experience of enlightenment. But we don't meditate for the experience of enlightenment. You know why? You know why? Because you're already the self, right? So you're not going to get the experience of the self because you're always experiencing yourself 24-7. Understand? There's never a moment when you're not experiencing yourself. So if you're meditating for the self, what are you doing? You're reinforcing your ignorance of the self. That's all you're doing. We're, we're meditating to what? Get rid of our ignorance. Keep our mind, huh? To remove the ignorance. Because there you're in the presence of the reflection of awareness. And you can see very clearly what the mind is, who the meditator is, what the self is, and your knowledge, and you can gain knowledge very quickly in that state. If you've been taught. If you've been given the... So, meditation is a great, great aid but it's not to produce enlightenment because you're already enlightened. There, in the meditation, you're thinking. There, there, Vedanta meditation is your thinking. It's called Savikalpa Samadhi. The, the thoughts are not obstructing. The thoughts are not Savikalpa. Vikalpa means thoughts, and and Savi means with. So it's 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 a meditation with thoughts. Well, what are those thoughts? They're not random thoughts. These are not just, you're not just sitting there watching your mind, what? Throw up a bunch of dumb ideas. No, you're consciously, what? Dwelling on the teachings. You're taking what you've learned huh, and meditating on it, consciously thinking it through in a totally quiet non-distracting environment where what where the light of awareness is is palpable where you can feel the light of awareness you know when we meditate you can feel it sometimes when we're chanting <coughs> here when i'm chanting you can feel it why does everybody go like this and they get this nice peaceful look on their face why because you're experiencing yourself that silence, that peace, that, that good feeling is the experience of yourself as it reflects what? In your subtle body. So that, that, that the presence of your, you're just in the presence of yourself when you're meditating. You've what? You've withdrawn your mind from the objects and you're now in a state inside. You're inside where, where what? where the objects aren't disturbing you. Yes, thoughts and feelings appear, they occur. But what? They just pass in and out. And as you keep your mind focused on the silence, what happens? The thought flow just gradually resides and then you start contemplating, meditating, thinking about the self, about this situation. Who am I? What's going on here? Where's the self? What is it? How do I know what I know? Right? You just sit there and think. And using this, what you've been taught, and, and soon it just becomes crystal clear. So meditation's for inquiry. It's not for what? For getting rid of thoughts. That's the idea. In, in yoga and so forth, what's the idea? is to tra either to transcend the mind or, or to, to destroy the mind, to get rid of your thoughts. That's called nirvikalpa samadhi or nirvana. <coughs> to get rid of the thoughts, the flames, the desires, and so forth and so on. We want our thoughts, but we want, we want deliberate thoughts here. So once you get the mind fixed on the reflection of the self and you start to feel that peace, there's no reason for the mind to think a bunch of thoughts, is there? Because it's happy. It's satisfied. That's why you sit like this and you enjoy it. Some, some, sometimes I feel 
stupid talking. When we have a nice little meditation, I think, Jesus, why should I start talking? Everybody's happy. They're all experiencing themselves. Why should I teach them anything? Huh? You're like, oh my God, I'm going to ruin their meditation by talking. <laughs> yeah, and there's some people who don't like it. There's some people who come to these things just for the energy, because their mind gets quiet, and they get to experience themselves, and they don't want to hear me blabbing. They close their eyes and, uh, and, and don't listen. They just let the words pass through. That's not wise either. You, that's a, you know it's fine to do that but but here we're like we're trying to like teach ourselves how to think <coughs> spiritually from a non-dual platform you know, all of our all of our thinking is coming from what from duality from the from the idea that the subject and the object are different that there's a division in the self and that division between the subject and the object is actually <coughs> a real division. So we're not capable really of thinking non-dually to seeing that thing and its opposite are both true. That's what satya mitya means. So we got, and this, this is a training, this is a discipline, it's called mental discipline. It's to, to train your mind to think in this way. So we want you to think. And meditation is a great place to think because you 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 know, isolated all of the external factors. You've isolated yourself from the external factors. And this is a time when you're home, you're alone with yourself. You don't have a wife and a kids and you're not a, a boss or an employee or you're not anything. You're just alone with yourself. And that's the absolute best environment for you know, discrimination. So that's why he's he's got it here. This, that's why it's a sixth chapter. So, time for time for a little break, and we'll come back and discuss meditation. Thank you for listening to the talk of James Wards on the Bhagavad Gita, recorded at Yoga Vidya Bad Meinberg near Hanover in Germany. More information on shiningworld.com and yoga-vidya.org.